MashaAllah. And thank you very much for that, Mayor Khalid. And just before we go on to our final speech, I just wanted to mention actually, Mayor Khalid, what that actually means is from the heart. That the name actually means from the heart. And I'm sure we all agree that they were singing from the heart. And it's sometimes people sing now as a, as a formality, just for the sake of it. But I'm sure you agree that all of us sing with pure love and affection. And it's a perfect way to lead us into our final speech to our refresh our heart and to refresh our minds and to refresh our attention for the final speech, the keynote speech, uh, who in each other, which is entitled Who Do I Worship? Who Do I Worship? And just a bit about the speaker before I introduce him. Uh, he's one of the founding members and continues to be one of the coordinators of the Hodua Institute based in Manchester and he also is a lecturer there on Islamic history. Uh, Mashallah is also uh, Teaching by profession, it's based in uh, Wallace in near Liverpool, Mashallah, he's been there for many, many years. He's doing a lot of community work there, helping to establish a masjid, inshallah, disease, and doing, doing a lot for the community. But there, in Manchester, in Birmingham, and in Coventry, in Hijaz, he's a well known figure uh, amongst his several friends and somebody who's looked up to by many. And why I myself personally have had the opportunity to sit with him and learn. Over the past few years, Alhamdulillah. It's none other than uh, Akhil, a lecturer, Akhil Awad Sahib, Ashwan Hijazi, and uh, I invite him to come and say the final speech, the keynote speech, the title of Fuyu Wabash. Since it's the keynote speech, you have to allow him to introduce him. Narayan Tegadil! Allahu Akbar! Keynote speech. He deserves more than that. Narayan Tegadil! Allahu Akbar! The one more other thing is going to be inshallah after this. Uh, after the zikr, uh, actually I should mention before we do introduce him, after the speech there will be a method of zikr uh, and then we'll close the wild shalom and disease so and thereafter we'll be doing the shalom and disease so do you know something? so one final time, we'll be glad Narayan Kharkadi Allahu Akbar Narayan Salat Ya Rasulullah Alhamdulillah Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Wal Aqibatu Lil Muttaqeen Salatu wa salamu ala sayyid al-anbiya wa al-mursaleen wa ala alihi al-tayyibin al-tafirin wa ashabi ajma'in amma ba'a Allah wa s.a.w. al-Qur'an al-Majid wa al-Qur'an al-Hamid Iyya ka nahu wa iyya ka nasta'in Salat Allah al-Azim wa balla ala rasuluh al-Nabiyyu al-Karim وقال الله تبارك وتعالى في شان كتبه مؤمنا عاملا إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد محمد وبارك وسلم صل عليه ماي Honorable and respected scholars of Deen, brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We've been playing around with microphones today, so I just want to do a quick test. If I move this one away, let's see if it is adequate. Alhamdulillah, it allows me to read my notes much more easily. There's a couple of notes that I have been making as uh, the speeches were being delivered. And one of the key factors, as I was listening, it was repeating itself quite a bit. As I was listening, I was realizing that what I was listening to was what I actually want to deliver. So I humbly that I'm in a very fortunate position where the only thing that is left for me really to say is Ameen. MashaAllah, the speakers that you have all been listening to have delivered very eloquent speeches on various topics. We've been dealing with rats, we've been dealing with celebrities, maybe one and the same thing, and we've been dealing with science. <coughs> so, all of these points have been quite adequately covered and the mic has been given to me 
to now discuss who do I worship. <clears throat> so inshallah, I will endeavor to cover some of what hasn't been covered in the hope that it may benefit me and inshallah it may benefit you. Mulana Asim on one side, who seems to have immediately left the room, he failed to point out that he was actually my cousin. And that is all I'm going to say because that will explain my introduction. I'll sort him out later, inshallah. <clears throat> so, to begin, we must firstly consider, as we always do, that all praise is for Allah, the creator of everything in this entire universe. All that we can see, all that we cannot see, all that we can understand, and all that we cannot understand. Countless blessings upon the greatest of Allah's creation, my master and yours, Rasulullah wasallam. And before I begin what is left of my speech, may I request with love and affection for you all to recite the rule of our Master Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad When I was invited to speak on this uh, auspicious occasion, I was told I would be speaking last. And I became a little bit concerned because I thought, am I coming for a speech or am I coming for a battle? And the battle I'm referring to is the battle of the senses. Alhamdulillah, you've all been sitting patiently, you will all be listening very intently. But now, possibly the senses are kicking in. Historically, what happens in a method of gathering like this, as soon as the final speaker stands up to deliver his speech, the kitchen staff begin to do their work. So as the speech is going on, more and more aroma fills the room. So, if we were dealing with arm people, okay, you all understand the term arm. If we were dealing with arm, that would indeed be a problem. But today, I'm going to do that, we are dealing with a category from, from within the arm known as khas. And how are you all khas? You are all khas because you have attended this blessed summit with the intention of pleasing Allah and His, uh, His Rasul, our Master. So inshallah, we don't need to engage in battle just yet, maybe a little bit later. So we have this question, who do I worship? On the face of it, we could consider this to be quite an offensive question. And there are other offensive questions which could be asked. An example of which I'm sure you're aware has been uh, mentioned before in such gatherings. And I'm going to offend all the Hajis now. With good intention, you'll, uh, you'll see my point in due course. But if we ask Hadisa, who attends the mosque for his namaz five times a day, Bajama, he has, alhamdulillah, had the benefit and the uh, opportunity to perform Hajj on numerous occasions, and he leads a very pious life. So if we then ask Hadisa, Hadisa, 
Are you on the straight path? Well, Anna Asim Awan has already uh, mentioned that if you were to ask this question of Imam, you would more likely be shown the front door in a horizontal position. But if we ask Adi Saba, Adi Saba, are you on the right path? Are you on the straight path? The common sense answer and the logical answer is yes. I am performing my namaz, I perform hajj, I fulfill my fara'is, I look after my fara'is. So yes, I would say that I am on the right path. However, an ayat of the Quran which has been narrated already uh, in one of the speeches, Hindina Sirat al Mustaqim. Oh Allah, guide us to the straight path. Now, when we are in the status of uh, namaz, in every rakat, we have to repeat this ayat. So, if namaz itself is the straight path, then we are in error. Because while we are in the status of namaz, we are asking to be guided to the straight path. So the straight path is not actually my topic of today. But I just want you to set the scene that these questions can, on the face of it, potentially cause offense. However, alhamdulillah, as I mentioned, you are from the category of the khas. So, if this question had caused offense, then before now, before this particular time now, there would have been uproar. Wherever the publicity for this event had gone, whoever had been handed a leaflet would have boycotted this event. They would have said, what sort of question is this? Who do I worship? It is straightforward. It is, uh, you know, it doesn't need to be asked. However, by virtue of the fact that an uproar was not caused, leads us to suggest that this question has in fact a degree of validity. And the evidence of this is you all sitting here wanting to know what is the answer to the question, who do I worship? Now again, if we continue with this concept of Ahmed Khas, if we address this question to the arm, by arm I mean everyone, human creation, celebrities included. So you address this question to the arm, you will get various responses. The Jew, the Christian, and the Muslim would all refer to Allah. In my preparation, I was actually hoping to find out what is the word for Allah in the Jewish language. Obviously in Christianity, we refer to Allah as God. But unfortunately, my internet connection let me down. I typed the necessary question into Google, but the connection was lost. So inshallah, if any of you can uh, educate me later on, uh, please uh, do so. So if we address this question to the arm, we will get various responses. One will say God, one will say Allah, and from others we may get a whole list. We may get a, a complete menu. Because as we know, in the, day, in the day and age that we live, there are still those who worship many gods. So on Monday they may worship one god, on Tuesday they may worship someone else. So you wouldn't get one distinct answer. If we address this question to 
the cross? The answer is Allah. We all here worship Allah. But again, that is on the, you know, that is the immediate answer. That is the answer to the question. But the question has many facets. And it is those facets that we are hoping to explore today, inshallah. Now one of the best ways of trying to understand uh, life and all that happens within life is to look at history. If we consider history and what has passed, we may uh, be in a position to help ourselves today. So on this particular topic, has there been a situation where someone has to ask themselves, who do I worship? And the answer is yes. Hazrat Ibrahim was faced with this very question. It was a question that he created himself. He raised this question within himself. And I'll briefly explain, I'm sure you're aware of the, uh, of the history of Hazrat Ibrahim but I'll briefly explain, just to put it into context within my speech. Hazrat Ibrahim was the son of a carpenter. His father used to create idols, statues, that were then sold and worshipped. So he, number one, he earned his living through carpentry, but what he was making was, in effect, idols that were worshipped. So Hazrat Ibrahim thought, hang on a minute, there's something not quite right here. My father, who is a human being, with his own hands, he is creating these idols. Using wood and his tools, he is creating idols, he is creating statues. These statues are then revered. These statues then become deities, they become worshipped. This doesn't sound quite right. So, Ibrahim asked his father, he said, Oh father, what's going on? I don't understand how something that you have been creating in your workshop, you have sold it, it now becomes a god. It now becomes worship. Please explain. His father explained, but his father, because his livelihood was entrenched in this whole process, the explanation his father gave was in a way to try and pacify Ibrahim al -Islam. Because he knew that if Ibrahim al -Islam continued in this way, continued to question, then my livelihood is going to be compromised. Ibrahim al -Islam wasn't satisfied. So he began to discuss this matter with his friends, with others around him. He began to raise the issue, bringing you know, to the fore of everyone's minds. And again, his father became concerned. He thought, you know what, I'm going to be out of a job. But also, he was concerned for the security of Ibrahim al In that day and age, idol worship was the dumb thing. So you have one individual standing up saying, you're worshipping idols. You're doing completely the wrong thing. So he was worried for his security also. One day, Ibrahim al -Islam was in a, a very unique uh, situation where he was alone in the temple. And the temple was filled with these idols. And there was one chief idol. Ibrahim al -Islam took the opportunity to smash each and every one idol, except for the biggest one. 
and then he left the temple. The people caught up with him because they had a suspicion that he was actually Ibrahim al -Islam. And they said to him, Oh Ibrahim, did you smash all of our gods? He said, No, of course I didn't. But I do have a suspicion that it was the big one. If you were to go into your temple and ask the idols that have been smashed who it was, they'll point their finger at the big one. For if they're your gods, surely they'll be able to tell you. So this started a process of realization that idol worship is not an option. There's something more than that. So Ibrahim was continually asking himself a question, who do I worship? He looked at the stars and he thought, you know what, that's something I've never seen. There's nothing else like it. So that must be my Lord. That must be worthy of worship. When the stars disappeared, when the night ended, he thought, no, they, they can't be. He saw the moon. He thought, there's only one moon. It must be that the moon is the true one to be worshipped. The moon disappeared. When the moon said, where, where was the moon? So again, he thought, you know what, it's not, it's not the moon. And the same process happened with the sun. But again, the sun set. So how could the sun be the one truly worthy of worship? So the conclusion he came to was that the one true essence that is worthy of worship is he who has created all of this. He realized someone something must have created this. So what I'll do is I'll devote my life to that creator. And this, as you can see, analyzed in this context, is a lesson for us. But today, who is going to stand up and start worshipping uh, the stars? If anyone is, they're probably in the local uh, asylum. Who is going to stand up and start worshipping the moon? Who is going to stand up and say that they are worshipping the stars, uh, the moon and the sun? It, it's not happening, is it, today? It would not happen. But what we have to consider is where in the time of Ibrahim he was looking at the stars, he was looking at the moon, and he was looking at the sun. In this day and age, what are they the equivalent of? But today what we are faced with is a situation where we call ourselves Muslim. We say that we are Muslim, we believe in Allah and His Rasul, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the answer to the question is we worship Allah. But let's look a little bit deeper now. Let us consider once again the validity of this question. We've spoken a lot, my fellow speakers have, have spoken in depth about various issues uh, relating to our dunya existence, relating to our nafs. We educate ourselves. Why do we educate ourselves? To establish a career. Why do we want a career? To gain wealth. Along with the wealth will come status. So the two main reasons why we engage in, in such processes, one is for material gain and one is for the elevation of our status. Where is action for Allah? 
In all of that, how many of us can say that we have been doing that to seek the pleasure of Allah? That is the real question. Not who do I worship. The real question is what do I do that facilitates my worship? And the situation becomes confusing because we consider all of these questions but at the same time we continue with our ibadah. We continue to perform our prayers, we continue to uh, perform our hajj. So the issue becomes quite confused. And it is that confusion which each and every one of you has to address on a personal level. When Allah Asimsah has said and is expanded on the mission that is HCT, to change society, we must first change ourselves. If each and every one of us changes our attitude and ourself, we can then influence society at large. We were talking about nafs a few moments ago, and the nafs was also mentioned before as being like a horse, a wild horse. I don't advocate that any of you should buy a lasso, find a wild horse, and try and tame it. Just take the theory, yeah? Not all theory should be put into practice. Although, if any of you do, please tell me, let me know how it was, because then I won't have to do it. So, we're not going to go and find a wild horse and, and try and tame it. The wild horse, in this context, we're referring to, is our nafs. Once you tame your nafs, you will lead the horse, the horse will not lead you, inshallah. Now, our lives today are relatively easy. Again, when we consider history, we can see that the times before ours were rather more difficult. Today we have security, we have um, every kind of solar. We turn the tap on, water comes out, hot, cold, whichever way we want it. The only jihad that we engage ourselves in is on a monthly basis when the bank statement comes. So then we, you know, we pick the blower up and we're on the phone to the bank manager. You know, this is our, this is the extent of our jihad. Now, in this comfortable situation, we are getting it wrong. I'm sure you'll agree that we can improve. We can try to perform each and every act for the pleasure of Allah. And then, truly can we say that we worship Allah. There is a famous Bhakya that I am about to uh, narrate. And this puts into context our own situation here. We have all the time in the world. We can get up when we want, we can go to work when we want, we have an easy day at work. And even then, we cannot, you know, put these things into context. <clears throat> On the battlefield, Hazrat Ali, was faced with an adversary. Hazrat Ali was about to strike the final blow. His adversary was in a weak position. He was about to strike the final blow. His adversary realized his fate realized he was helpless. What more could he do to attempt to save himself? What he did was to spit in the beautiful face of Hazrat Ali, What happened after that? 
If anyone spat in your face, what would you do? You would become so enraged that you'd want to sort him out. After getting you know, a few of your brothers along as well, because he might be big. <laughs> when you get your gang together, you're going to sort him out. What did Hazrat Ali do? After he was spat at, he stopped and he walked away. This is in the battlefield. Hazrat Ali, about to deliver the final strike, he spat in the face, so he stops and he walks away. His adversary was so confused by this that he asked Hazrat Ali, he said, What are you doing? This, you know, it doesn't equate two plus two, this does not equal four. What's going on? You're about to deliver the final blow and you stop. Why? And the explanation that Hazrat Ali gave was this, that I was in the battlefield, I was doing jihad for the sake and for the pleasure of Allah. That is the reason I was going to kill you, because you were an enemy of Islam. That was the reason I was there. And that was the only reason for me to kill you. After you spat in my face, I realized that now things are going to get tricky. Because had I continued in my action, I would have killed you for my sake. Because of what you have done to me. And that is what caused me to stop. The thinking that is there on the battlefield and today, we, there is no battlefield. Where is the battlefield? We are living a, a comfortable life, and yet we still cannot think. Now, moving on to a, a slightly different angle of focus. So worship requires focus, but again, the focus has to be seen in context, and it has to be controlled. You can focus on the right thing, that's fine, but if you focus on the wrong thing, that is not fine. But sometimes, even focusing on the right things can cause us Heaven, 
and they are focused on avoiding hell. So if I get rid of heaven, and if I get rid of hell, the only thing that's left is Allah. So they will be focused on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My dear audience, let us make an intention to re-establish Allah as the true focus in our lives, as the reason why we do what we do. And you will see where you involve Allah in your life. You can't go wrong. You can't go wrong. Let us all engage in this process of zikr. For those of you who have heard me uh, lecture before, you will know that sometimes my lectures are not quite in the order that they should be in. Sometimes the beginning comes at the end, and the end comes at the beginning. So I'm going to reference the ayat of the Quran that I quoted in the beginning. You alone we worship, and from you alone we seek help. Again, just as the ayat in the same surah, surah Fatiha, we have to quote this ayat in every single rakat of every single namaz. If we don't, our namaz is not uh, complete. In the same way, we have to quote this ayat, we are continually reminding ourselves who we are worshipping. You alone we worship. A speech that was delivered by a sister, she touched on this point of remembering Allah. And through the remembrance of Allah, inshallah, that is our success. And the second half is also quite interesting. <clears throat> so we have you alone we worship, and from you alone we seek help. What is Allah referring to when He says help? And aside that, alongside that, we have the question, where is this help going to come from? I'm actually going to leave you with those questions, because those questions, inshallah, may well be for another time and another blessed summit. Help from Allah may require more than one summit, inshallah. But all I'm going to leave, with you, uh, leave you with today, my dear audience, is that inshallah, everything that you have heard today, any atom weight of that which will cause you benefit, inshallah, may Allah accept that, and may we all benefit from all the words that we have heard today. And if it is Allah's will, I shall be present at the next summit. And I hope and pray that you all are also. Wa akhirul da'wah, and alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin.